All there right, so you got. So I I just have a few topics today. Um, really, just like two slides, but uh, could go long if there's a lot of discussion. Uh, I'm going to do some review of some information that we know. I'm going to elaborate on some things we've talked about before, and then I'm going to introduce a new problem which I've been thinking about. Uh, before I did, I just for some reason felt like putting this slide up here in defense of introspection. Um, and um, what do I mean by introspection? Introspection in neuroscience is essentially, that's my definition, using self-observed perceptual, state, perceptual states to infer facts and theories about the brain. And I put this up there because I remember a long time ago, probably a few decades ago, I heard a talk, whoops, sorry. I heard a talk, someone who said, you should never use introspection if you're a neuroscientist, it's, it's false. And I found just the opposite. I find introspection is very, very useful. And um, and I, I originally accepted this person's premise, but now I said, no, they're wrong. Introspection's great. So I'm gonna talk a lot about introspection today. On its own, it's never sufficient, or rarely, but it's really very helpful. Uh, I had a couple examples of things I use introspection all the time. Um, not, not sure it's worth going through these. Some of them become obvious, but a lot of them I'm gonna talk about today regarding introspection. This is very, very, I think, I feel like often this is very discouraged in neuroscience and in psychology as well. Like you, yeah, you, you it is. I should not rely on introspection or you, everything has to be like really well controlled yeah. hypotheses but, but, and experiments but, and so on. I think it's wrong. And, and um, it's, again, I think you can't only use introspection, but it's one of the tools that's very, very valuable. And I originally accepted it, as I said, but then later I said, wait a second, this is really useful. <laughs> this is not right. So uh, these, are, well, these are two examples. You know, I, I use it all the time. But, this, you've heard me talk about when grid cells remap. Uh, I, I can say that's, I equate that to the sense of being in a different room. Like all of a sudden you say, this is not the same room, this is a different room. I can't be in the mind of a rat, but I can imagine myself doing that. Another example is like noticing that when the, we, our eyes move, we don't, we have perceived stability, but we don't notice the, the movement through the saccades. And that immediately, that perceptual observation led to the, the conclusion that there must be pooling going on that is, you have to go from these changing states to a constant state in the mapping um, and the pooling. So this is, these are the kind of things you can just think about and just say, yeah, I, I observed this. I don't notice that my eyes are moving, but I notice the world seems stable. So there must, this must be occurring. The coffee um, mug example is probably another one. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to talk about the coffee mug <laughs> in okay. a second. <laughs> so um, anyway, so <laughs> let's just get into it. Um, but it's in the one more thing. It seems like the way I've particularly the way I've seen you doing it, you use it to sort of come up with things that have to be true in some sense, yeah. or sort of not not quite as theorems in mathematics, but it's sort of kind of, um, I don't know what the right word is, it's sort of assertions that have to be true in order for something else. We know something is occurring, therefore this has to be true. And this gives you bounds and yeah. gives you uh, a sense of what putting, to look it, for. It's a, it put constraints. Constraints. Yeah, yeah, and the second example here is a perfect example of that. You know, that we know that when the eyes move, that the inputs of the brain are changing, we know the neurons are changing, yet you have perceived stability on many different scenarios, not all scenarios. And that just tells you, it's a fact that there has to be a pooling operation going on. That is these changing patterns are being mapped into a stable pattern. There's just no way around it. <laughs> just, that's what it is. You know, the, the only, the argue, otherwise you would just say that, oh, well, your perceived stability is not really the action of neurons. It's, it's something else. Um, which is like a dualistic type of point of view. So anyway, let's get into it. We're gonna get a lot of examples as I go through the next slide here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of work through a review and adding things to it in a moment and, and sort of elaborating some things we've talked about in the past, but I've, I've got clearer definitions on them. So let's just talk about the thousand brains theory. It was originally, as you all know, it was this idea that, hey, I was observing my finger touching a coffee cup and they said, well, what does it require for the cortex to predict what my finger is gonna, feel, and we said, oh, it requires that the cortex or a column knows the, the object identity, the coffee cup, and it knows the location of the object, relative, uh, location of the sensor relative to the object, which implies reference frame. We then learned uh, subsequently that that wasn't sufficient, uh, and I'm surprised we didn't realize this initially, but it, it required the simulation that Lewis was doing, that we also needed to know, the cortex needs to know the orientation of the sensor to the object. That is the position of the finger could be at some location X, but the orientation of the finger at that point uh, determines what's going to be sensed. And so this made the, the problem more complicated that a column needs to know this additional piece of information, the, the orientation in space relative to the object in the sense. Uh, 
And I'm going to add one more to this, one we've talked about, but I'm really confident now I've, I've come much more clarity on this, which is scale. Um, and I'm going to go into depth in this in a second. So I'm just going to leave it here briefly in a moment. But the idea that when, when, a, uh, when a sensor is, is to make a prediction of what you're going to sense, there is often a scale involved. And, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute uh, in a second. Um, another thing we realized is that, uh, that the object identity is something that could be shared among columns. And so we propose that these long range connections in the neocortex are voting. Um, and this is what provides the stability that the, the voting neurons are reaching a consensus and they say, yep, that's what we're seeing. This is a coffee cup. That is what we perceive. We don't perceive the movement of the, of the eyes or the finger as much. You can perceive the movement of, your, of something like, if you attend to some sub piece. But if I'm just looking at a scene or I'm just casually touching a coffee cup, my perception is the coffee cup is stable and my perception is the thing I'm looking at is stable. And um, so we don't really perceive, generally we're totally unaware that our eyes are moving. Um, so uh, uh, then now we have an explanation for that. that it's these long range voting neurons that do this. Now let's talk about scale. Um, let me define what I mean by scale. Um, scale is a scalar. Uh, it's a ratio between a motor vector and path integration relative to the object. So imagine my finger is touching the side of the coffee cup and I move my finger, um, I, the movement leads to a prediction of a new location relative to the coffee cup. So I'm gonna move it up, I'm predicting a new location. But how much a movement uh, translates to a change in location depends. If I had a small coffee cup, like I reached my finger into a, into a box and I'm picturing an object, but now I'm touching a very small coffee cup. At first, I don't know that, but I kind of say, hey, this is a coffee cup, but it's really small. Once I know that, then I adjust all my movements relative to that. Basically, I can manipulate that coffee cup or any object at different scales once I know the, the relative scale of it. Um, uh, and, and what it's basically doing is just changing. When you're doing path integration, you have some movement vector, and then how much path integration, how much movement in, the, in a reference frame is the scale? That's what I mean by scale. It's not necessarily the size of an object. In the example I just used with the coffee cup, I could have a miniature coffee cup and my finger touches it. Well, that is a smaller object. But if I, if I was looking at a bicycle and the bicycle was four feet away from me, I would know how to move my eyes over to predict what I'm gonna see at different locations, like how far do my eyes have to move to go from wheel to wheel or from the wheel to the seat. If the, if the bicycle was eight feet away, the movement of my eyes would be much less to achieve the same movement in the object. I don't perceive those two objects as being different sizes. Yes, I, they are different sizes on my retina, um, but perceptually they're not different sizes. I, I know maybe I know it's further away, but even if I didn't, if I was looking at a picture of a bicycle on a piece of paper, I don't, and my eyes are circuiting over, I don't say, hey, this is a, this is a miniature bicycle. I don't do that. I say it's a bicycle. And um, so it doesn't always translate into like a, an object of different size. It's basically just saying, how much should I move if I'm moving my sensor in the in the in, in body space, how much should that? How should I scale that to be movement in the path integration in the object space? Um, I, and by the way, interrupt me if you have questions about any of these things. Uh, I, have, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, given given that kind of continuum you just described, would you the notion of whether something is within? Re I'm sorry to turn on my video. Uh, whether something is within reach or not would be a critical thing because it's like you make an instantaneous decision as to whether I can reach out to touch it or whether it's something remote from me, it would seem like you would dedicate a certain amount to just evaluating whether whatever this thing is, is with intangible. So remember, re remember the, the, the what and the where path is input, right? Um, and the idea that something which is in reach, that's a where path like thing, right? That's a, that is a, uh, a mapping in body space, not in object. Um, so there's separate parts of the cortex that are dedicated to that problem than the problem of inferring an object. So I'm only talking right now about inferring and recognizing an object or learning an object. Uh, and so you can assume for the moment that I've already touched this thing. Um, and, and now I'm just trying to recognize what this thing is. And therefore I'm moving within a reference frame relative to the object. Whereas if I want to reach for the thing and know if I'm going to reach for the thing, that's a where pathway thing. And we believe that's, um, a reference frame relative to the body, 
And therefore, it's like, okay, how far away is that from, how far away is my hand from where that thing is? But it doesn't tell me what the thing is. It just says, in body space, where is that? So I think we can separate those two things, Kevin. Okay, so, so let me uh, 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 mention this. So if, in the sense of an object was available to you, so you could tangibly touch, you could learn about it through touching as well as by seeing, versus an object you've only seen remotely, never been able to touch, do you want to, is there any distinguishment between object recognition capability in those cases? Well, I think that this has been a confusing aspect for us because obviously when you touch something, your finger's right on it, right? There is the location of your, of your, your finger is, in the, is actually on, in the point on the object reference frame. But when you're looking at something, your eyes are remote, right? And this has puzzled us quite a bit in the past, you know, try, I, I think these can be reconciled. And part of what I'm doing is reconciling them here. And part of that is to just separate out scale as a separate entity. And don't think of scale as necessarily an object thing. It's just how much I have to move to move to a new location on the object. Um, it's not a complete solution to that problem, but it's part of the solution to that problem. And so if you think about it this way, you can say, yeah, and I'm moving, I have to move a certain number of degrees to, to move to a new location on an object. Well, how, that's the scale. How far do I have to move to do that? Um, depends on how, either how big the image is I'm looking at, how far away it is, but I can just separate those out. I can just say, okay, I've got something I'm sensing and scale is part of that solution. Um, but ultimately we try, we, we would like to, re, we'd like to bring those two things together. Uh, we want to bring the touch and the sense together. And, and touch, by the way, has the same issue. Um, so for example, uh, let's say I'm, I'm, instead of something like touch, let's call it uh, sensory motor or, or, or somatic movement. Um, if I want to write my signature um, and, uh, I can, and I can do that, I can write my signature larger or smaller. Um, and I can do that by just scaling up the, this uh, scale vector. I'd say, oh, well, I'm, I'm trying to move through the space of my reference frame of my signature. Uh, I say I have a reference frame of what my signature looks like. Uh, and, but if I want to do a bigger version of it, I just scale up the, um, uh, scale up the amount of movement. So I, I execute the same motor behavior, but I scale it up so then I move further. Similarly, I could say I'm, I'm, I'm trying to write my signature at the same size as I normally do it. But in one case, I'm using a pen that's very close to my fingers or a pen that's a very long or I'm doing it with a stick. And so the movements my hand makes to actually write the signature at the same size on the paper varies because I, I might move my hand much less if I'm drawing with a stick. So this idea that I, I were able to just map motor behaviors in one space, the body space, um, to, to movement in an object space is sort of a general principle. And it can relate to the object being a different size or it can relate to being further away uh, or, you know, it, 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 it's sort of a general principle. I'm trying to sort of not think about it exactly like, oh, it's, a, it's you know, I'm trying to reduce the differences between sense uh, vision and touch. I don't know if that helped at all. Okay. Um, and that, my point here is that that's the second point I make in this box is that scale is not necessarily tied to an object. You can just think of scale as, as this mapping between how much do I move in one reference frame versus how much I'm moving in another reference frame. One kind of analogy, I sometimes used to understand this as uh, just think of a transformation matrix in, in computer graphics. They're not the same thing, but a transformation matrix tells you how two reference frames align with one another. And, uh, you know, there's a displacement component to the transformation matrix. There's a rotation component and there's a scale component. And these are kind of these number two, three, and four here. Mm -hmm. um, now, they're, they're not, it's not going to be the same here. Uh, but it's it's sort of analogous to that. I think. Yeah, I, in in uh, this is in computer graphics you're talking about, or, or computer robotics? graphics or robotics or no. standard computer vision. Okay. It's just so sort I of guess, a transformation matrices. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think that's the same idea. Um, then, yeah, it's exactly the same. Idea. Now, in the past, I have sort of thought of the floated around the proposal multiple times that this is a, the scaling is occurring in the thalamus. I'm now much more certain that that's true. Um, I've moved myself along the scale of certainty here. Um, I, I put it in the sort of 98, 99% likelihood category. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but uh, perhaps the best is that we know of a mechanism that would do scaling. And, um, and that involves the thalamus. And specifically, we think about path integration 
uh, using grid cells. Um, it, almost all the, the theories that we're considering these days um, uh, involve the, the theta rhythm um, and, and the beating or the sort of the, the two frequencies of theta rhythm, one representing a baseline uh, theta rhythm and one representing uh, uh, that the same frequency that's been that scale it's modified in a scalar way based on velocity of movement, and you can you can change the scale of movement by just changing the base frequency. So if you just in slightly increment or decrement the base theta frequency, then all movements get scaled exactly as we want them to do. And we know that there's a strong theta interaction between the thalamus and the cortex and every, everywhere we go. Um, Another thing we can, we can say is that the scaling factor has to be applied to every column in a sensory modality. That is, if my fingers touch, my hand is grabbing a coffee cup, some of my fingers can't be working at one scale and some at another. Either the coffee cup is big or it's small, but it's not like half it's big and half it's small. We just don't do that. Um, and it seems to me everybody thought about it in introspection. There's, no, there's never a point where you'd want to, within a sensory modality, one scale to apply part of those columns and another scale probably other parts of the column. So there's a shared scale factor between columns in the sensory modality. And that's easily done in the thalamus too, because the thalamus is this centrally located thing where you it's generating these theta rhythms and you can easily change the theta rhythms that that get broadcast over a broad area of your cortex. And of course in the past many times I've argued that these matrix cells in the thalamus are the cells that broadcast this frequency. Uh, well, I'd argued that they broadcast a scalar of time. And um, this is completely consistent with this idea here too, that if you look at those matrix cells, a very few set of cells broadcast broadly within a sensory modality, but not in another sensory modality. So these, these cells sit there, fit the bill perfectly to broadcast to uh, large areas in your cortex that are all doing vision or all doing touch. And, um, and I've already, for other reasons, speculated they're doing um, uh, timing issues and speeding up and slowing down of, of, of melodies in the past. And that's exactly the same thing here. So um, what, what's the uh, range of the theta rhythms? I mean, how much dynamic, how much scale? I don't know that, I don't know if we know the answer to that question. Maybe someone does. I do know that it's, it's surprisingly sensitive. If you, if you, the whole, uh, the whole sort of uh, um, theta concept for path integration requires very small changes in frequency because we're, we're, we're basically moving the, the, the interference frequency, the beat of these two different frequencies. And if you just change the frequency a little bit, it makes that difference quite large. So it's, it's quite a sensitive system. It wouldn't require much um, change uh, in the frequency to um, affect a fairly large scale change. Well, I don't know, but I don't know the direct answer to your question. Um, well, I, I guess, I, I think you, you did answer in the sense that you can have a small delta on the theta, and it, it, it if you're having interference patterns, they can shift, you know, radically uh, over yeah. that. So, so you can. But I was also wondering about the uh, the, the paradigm that was presented in that paper that we uh, looked at recently with the uh, uh, Cajon and maps for the uh, V1, V2, you know, uh, se uh, sections of the of the optical cortex. I was wondering if there's something analogous to that where you have the central scale and then you have other outer lying adjacent regions which actually handle the problem of scales at larger magnitudes. Well so so this is the this is like that that paper was consistent with the idea we proposed or I proposed which is that you know columns in V1 and V2 are are basically dealing with different scales uh, on the retina. But within those scales you still need variation. It'd be like saying right. You know, right. I can quantize this into two buckets or three buckets of scale, but within that, I still have to speed things and slow things down because any particular object, I have to match those. Um, yeah, I, I was just suggesting both of those might be might yeah. be at play, and, and whether the uh, thalamus has analogous structures to that. Oh yeah, well, the thalamus has the, the scale could apply to all those regions. It's just that maybe some of the regions aren't going to be uh, uh, essentially modeled. Some of the regions may not be able to model the thing that you're looking at. Uh, but as far as I know, the matrix cells in the thalamus, assuming that those are the ones who are doing this, they, like in for visual reasons, they project to V1, V2, and V4. Um, the same cells do. It's not like there's separate cells, the cells go to different places. As far as I know, that's the case. Um, and they, so they broadly over the region and they project uh, multiple regions within the, the modality. Okay, so that 
that would kind of argue there's a there's a connection there's a scale connection going on there not just hierarchical yeah. representation no, no, that's scale right. connection. So, so these two things go together you have scale based on uh, structural um the size of the region of the retina that's being projected to a column that's one level of scale and then the other level of scale is the actual tweaking of the speed of movement related to that uh, reference frame or something. okay that makes sense yeah. I, it was interesting question here. My last point here, first of all, so this is shared. In some sense, you could argue that the columns are voting, but not voting really. There, there are some sense they have to settle on a common solution. Um, so if I, you know, but it's it's not like I'm not sure that there's a voting. Like I'm not, I don't know, I don't know the actual actual mechanism that would do this. How do how does the how does the column uh, play around with these things to reach the right answer, uh, reach the right scale? I don't know yet, but I don't think it would be too hard to figure that out. Um, but it's kind of like voting, but it's not like, I, but it's different, obviously. It's, it's happening in the thalamus itself. Perhaps it's, it's happening with thalamic particular nuclei. I don't know uh, where it's happening. It's happening maybe in the layers that maybe just within the, um, the matrix cells themselves. I don't know. Could, could it uh, be that there is some notion of where there's a locus in one of these scale spaces that it says, I'm doing a little bit of movement. I'm getting this kind of reaction and I should be localizing my attention in 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 some weird sense in and turning off the other inputs and saying this is the scale that I want to be operating in and that's a shifting concept yeah I think in the general idea that'd be right right in the general idea you say hey I'm making a prediction but the prediction was either over, overshot or undershot something like that and so you just somehow you have to detect I'm doing overshooting or undershooting and then adjust the data frequency accordingly um, I think that's what you're saying, Kevin. Um, yeah, the, uh, both the theta and, and, and what region. Uh, oh, well, so yeah, I, I guess I haven't been thinking about the regions as much, yeah. Uh, imagine that every region's trying to do this, right? And so some regions will succeed and some won't. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's it, right? Well, well, I was thinking what would happen is, is that if you're grossly mismatched, then you're going to get random firings in that region, there's nothing going to be stable about it. But in the region, if you pick the right scale, you're only going to see, you know, small variations within that region. Maybe that that reinforcement says, okay, that's the one I should pay attention to as opposed to the one that's overshooting grossly all over yeah, the place. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. But uh, it's it's that's an area. Yeah, I think that's right, but it's a lot of unknowns there. Um, I want to make one other observation here, the last point on this box. Is I don't I'm not aware that the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex has anything equivalent to the thalamus. I'm not aware that they project to the thalamus the way the neocortex does. My impression is they don't. I've never heard anything like that. Maybe someone else, maybe Marcus, or someone else knows about that. But my impression is these structures, the grid cells and the place cells in the hippocampal complex, there is no equivalent relationship to the thalamus in this regard. And so the question then that comes up is this, do do place cells and grid cells have this ability to scale? And I think there's some empirical evidence that they don't. And this goes back to if you put a rat in an environment and you, um, you then, and the rat learns this environment, then you change the size of the environment. You start stretching or, or making it smaller. Within a small variation of size, the grid cells sort of adjust. They kind of move in or move out a little bit. But if you go beyond a, even a modest amount of, of scaling of the environment, the grid cells rematch which would tell us that the rat, again, introspection, the rat is saying, this is not the same room anymore. This is a different room, you know, even though it looks exactly like the other rooms I've seen, but it's, it's just a little bit too big. Therefore, it is not the same room. I am not able to scale this in any significant way. Um, where you and I can scale things very easily. I can make a dollhouse and I can look in the room and say, yeah, that's my living room. Oh, well, let's move the furniture out the kids. It's no problem. I can see that as my living room, even though it's in a dollhouse, right? I mean, I, I would use the same map. I wouldn't, I don't, it's not that I'm fooled that I'm in that room, but I would use the same map for it. I wouldn't say that is a completely different room. There's the furniture arrangement makes no difference. Um, but I wonder if that in that case, it's the, it's our neocortex that's recognizing is still our same room. Yes, not, I think uh, that's right. In, in the sense that I think you're right. Um, that, and we do know that many of the sort of the area representations that occur in the hippocampal complex also occur in prefrontal cortex. You can see that in the, those are the those fMRI experiments we've talked about. So we have the ability to do this, but my only point is it's, I think that this is an ability that didn't exist in the original uh, map, environment mapping mechanism of grid cells and play cells. 
and it wasn't really necessary. I mean, what, you just never really had to deal with scale changes in, in the yeah, natural Yeah, because the physical world doesn't change. <laughs> exactly, yeah. right. So. But when you start observing things from a distance, uh, like with you know, looking at a, a bicycle from different directions, or you start manipulating objects in their, are different sizes, but are similar, you know, then the objects in the world have the scale. Uh, scale. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you think somatosensory needs a scale then? Yeah, well, I think is it clearly it, has to because uh, because I gave the examples of of, of um, touching a small coffee cup, um, you know, or, or just pick right, up a stapler, right. right? I have a big stapler, a little stapler. I don't say, oh, that's a completely new object. A big stapler says, yeah, it works like the same as a small stapler. <laughs> Here, I'm going to use it, right? Um, I I don't get confused. I I'm aware that it's a different size, but I use I I'm using the same math and the same grid cells and the same movement behaviors, and I can scale them all up. So I think that's happening. I also give the example of signing your name and different motor commands and using tools. You know, it's very interesting that I can, I can use a tool that's a short tool to do something. I can use a long tool and I have to adjust my motor behaviors, but perceptually, I don't think it's any different. Like I'm prying something open with a screwdriver. It's a short one, a long one. It's, I change my behaviors. It's just natural. You know, you just scale up your behaviors. So I think, I think this matter century cortex is doing this. I think this is going on in, in all cortical regions. I mean, if the matrix cells are doing this in the thalamus, like I'm pretty sure I'm confident they are, as far as we know, they exist everywhere in the cortex. So every part of the neocortex will be dealing with scale uh, one way or another. Um, and I think it's a universal property of, um, of uh, well, it's a universal property of transforms as you just want to point out a moment mm -hmm. ago. So I think it was interesting to think of like how a rat may not see a room as the same once it's, if it's, you know, 30% bigger, even though it has all the same features in it. You know, say, oh, there's no room. I have to learn it over again. That would be the implications for the experiment there. Um, so to recognize an object, not only to make a prediction, but to recognize an object, the column has to simultaneously infer all these things. It has to infer what the object is, the location of the sensor on the object, the orientation of the sensor to the object, and the scale of the object. These are all unknowns. If I stick my finger into a black box and I'm going to touch something with my single finger, I don't know any of these things. And so they all have to be inferred through movement. So there's a, it just says, okay, a column has to do all these things. I haven't been able to think of anything else a column has to do, but I mean, well, uh, it, it, in this list, I haven't thought of another thing in this list that has to simultaneously resolve. There might be, but at the moment I can't think of anything. So but that's quite a bit uh, to, to resolve all these things simultaneously. Um, what about like weird deformations or stretching or? That's a good question. It's like that. Mm. Yeah, that's like that's a more that's, that's a more like, complex thing. That's like <laughs> scale in one dimension. That would, that's weird. You're right. That's a good point. Like you take a, a I made let's say I took a coffee cup and I and I stretched it out so it's, the top is like an oval. Um, yeah, I could probably I would. Well, I would know that it's a cup. I would I, would I think it's the same coffee cup at a different scale, or would I say? Like for example, what if I was looking at it? I was looking at, I showed you a, a picture of a coffee cup and I showed you a picture of the same coffee cup at a different scale and a different orientation. I wouldn't say that's a different coffee cup. I'd say, yeah, that's the same coffee cup. However, if I stretched it, I would say, no, that's a different cup. Uh, there's, there's, there's no question, that's different. That's not the same one as I saw before. Now, I would still be able to see similarities between it. I would be able to say, well, it's got a handle, so I know how to use a handle and it's got a lip, so maybe I could drink from it. I would think that would be more of a say like, no, this is different. I, it's definitely different. It's not like I'm not, I know this is not the same object anymore, um, but I might still recognize it as being a stretch version of the object, but I would, I would not be tempted to think it's the same object. Like I would if I just saw it at different distances from me. Um, so I, think I, think we, that, I think we have a bias toward rigid body transformations for a lot of these things. But if you imagine a, uh, a bunch of balloons that you know are distorted in various ways, we, uh, but the pattern on them was consistent. Would you say these are kind of the same balloons, you know, despite the distortions? I think there's there's an expectation component about there of, of when you see an object, whether uh, you believe it to be rigid and should rigidly transform, and those things make identity, whereas a stretched version of it would be uh, somehow, uh, it would be a different object. So I, I'm wondering how much 
how much you're modeling what the expectation is of what kind of distortions fall into the same. Well, I guess what I'm saying here is if we if the matrix cell idea is correct, then there there is no mechanism for distorting in one dimension versus another dimension. This doesn't appear to be. Um, and uh, now we can do that, uh, but my my point is that the system would say. If I try, if I had an object that was distorted in one dimension and not in all dimensions, then this point I'm making here would say, that, well, that's a different object. It's not the same object anymore. Now, the question is, could I see it as being similar to previous objects? And the answer would, there would be yes. And I, and I propose, and I don't have anything about it here today, but I propose in the past that when we look at the subcomponents of an object, like we attend to different features of the object, but the different features are in some sub subset of the features are in a relative arrangement that we've seen before. We will say this is similar to an object I've seen before, but and I would I would know how to new, manipulate that new object, but I wouldn't think it's the same object. I would say yes, this is a this is an object. This is similar to an object I've seen before because there's some of the subfeatures are arranged similarly, but some of them are not. And therefore, um, I I would I would be able to say yes, this is similar to a coffee cup, or this is similar to the, a particular thing I've seen before, but it is different. But here's the similarities are based on these attended to subcomponents. So if I think I saw something that was highly distorted, like a very, you know, like a oval-shaped coffee cup, at first I would say, hmm, what is this? And then I would tend to different features of it. And I say, yeah, these features are arranged similar to how they were arranged in other things I've seen. And therefore I'd see the similarity between them, but I wouldn't be fooled into thinking it's the same thing. So I would, I would create a new reference frame for that object. So that would imply that uh, it's a learned capability to distinguish identity from similarity. That you would have to explore um, that and kind of confirm it. Okay, that yeah, that's the same. That's the same one. I, when I, bring I don't. It. I guess I don't know if you say learn. I, I guess what we've we've argued in the past, and I uh, wrote about this in the book, is it, and, and is that when you to, to learn the structure of something, you first you have to attend to the different components. And as you attend to them one after another, you say, oh, I recognize here's a handle, here's a this, here's a this, here's a this. As you do that, you are building up their relative positions to each other in a reference frame. So it's just the, the learning an object is literally just attending to the features of the object and assigning it to locations in the reference frame. And now a new object comes along, it's, it doesn't quite fit, but as you attend to some subset of the features, they seem similar to subset of features in a previously learned object there, say this is similar and has similar behaviors. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by a learned, everything has to be learned. And right. I think the method by which you learn is the same way as you would see similarities. I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking that if you know a child is posed the question, is this the same object? The notion of identity, it would seem like there's a fairly complex number of things that have to go together, whether I recognize it as a coffee cup versus it is the same coffee cup. So I'm just wondering where where that threshold is. Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer, I think I tried to answer that question. Um, if all the components fit within the same reference frame, then it's the same object. If, the, if there are different components at different locations or, the, or the components are different, you know, if they're, if they're stretched in the reference frame in some sense, then I would see it as different. But okay. if everything, I, but I'm arguing here that everything scales up or scales down, um, like, like looking at a picture that's close, a picture that's further away, I would not see it as the same. I would see it as the same object, you know? So two images of bicycles, one farther away, one big and one small, I don't see them as different bicycles. I just say it's the same bicycle even yeah. though they have been scaled. But if I saw a bicycle that had been stretched in one dimension so the, the wheels were oval, I would say that's not a bicycle. It's similar yeah. to a bicycle, but it's not a bicycle. <laughs> I, I was, just, a, I was yeah. just thinking that at, at some higher level, the, the notion of identity is a crisp concept. You make a decision, yes, it is, or is it not, as opposed to it's you know 3% similar. Well, I think it goes back to this, uh, the issue of the rat in the room. If you can assign the features the observed features to a reference frame and they all fit, it's the same object. If it's not, if you have to re, if you, if the, the system flips over and it remaps the, the grid cells, the, that is re-anchors the grid cell modules, then perceptually it's a different object. That's the difference between a, a common object. You're like, this is the same object as I using the same grid cell uh, anchoring. That is, I'm, I'm anchoring the grid cell modules the same way, That's then that's the object. If I have to re-anchor the grid cell modules, then it's a different object. So, so if you put the rat in a scaled up room, would he go directly to where he found the cheese last time or would he says, this is different, I got to start. Well, I don't know if that experiment's been done. Um, I would, if, if it's a scaled up room and he remaps his, um, his reference frame, then I would be very surprised if the rat um, 
uh, would, would think he knows the room. Um, now, the rat may look at various things. He might say, well, there's a chair here and there's a sofa there for being a human. Sort of thing. And I sometimes found that she's, you know, at the intersection of the chair and the sofa, I might do that, but I would still think it's a different room. But if it was just like, um, I, I, I don't know, you have to be careful, but my, my, my argument would be that the rat sees it as a different room and therefore it doesn't know anything about that room, but he might start seeing similarities and use those similarities in the same way I talked about how we can do that. Um, but it would be a different room. The rat wouldn't just, I mean, here's, here's one way to put it. If the rat was in that room and, um, and, then you, um, and then you turned off the lights, I don't think the rat could do path integration to get to the food. Whereas if it was the same room, the rat could do that. The rat could say, oh, I know I'm in this room. I know how to get to the food, even though I can't see anything. But if, it's, if, if the rat says, this is a different room, then the rat wouldn't have any idea how to get to, to the food. He'd say, I'm in a different room. I don't, I don't, even, I don't even associate food with this room. <laughs> Something along those lines. I imagine you can make an experiment that does that. Mm -hmm. I just want at this point, the last point on the bottom left here is that if we think about what a column has to do, and this gets back to your point earlier, super time. A column has to, has to do this sort of transform. It has to take movements in a center space. Like in this case, think of like a finger, like I'm extending my finger or I'm a certain, certain number of degrees or I'm moving my eyes four degrees to the right or something like that. And it has to transform that um, uh, to movements in the object space and, and back, right? So, and that involves if I'm going to take a movement in in, um, in, in sensor space and move to an object space, it's both a transformation based on orientation. So it's like, okay, you know, I have to I have to use the orientation of the finger to the object to know, you know, which direction am I moving in the object space, and I have to scale it by the scale factor. So these two things have to occur to make a proper transformation of a movement in one space to a movement in the other space, and it has to go back. The cortex has to, the column has to do both ways because I could say, I want to get to a particular location in object space. What is the movement that I need to do to create that? So it has to go back and forth between these two. So I thought, to me, this is useful to know that this is, these are more, um, this makes the problem more complicated, but these are more uh, constraints on the problem. Um, to think about scale and uh, orientation and how they have to be, how they have to play in this, in both transformations going from one space to another. But again, I'm always thinking about in terms of path integration, you know, movement in one space versus movement in another space um, and, and trying to take up abstract it to that level. Jeff, right. yeah. one, one of the scenarios thinking about like in a VRs or any sort of mixed reality, usually you expect objects to be a little bit distorted as well. And you can't. Why? Why would you expect that? Well, because it's not. It's just a simulation, right? It has like glitches, and you expect that you. You're, you, you're saying you're saying virtual reality is not very good, so it introduces errors. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. But okay. when you, what you are in it, you know that you know that coffee cup. Even though as you turn your head around, sometimes it's going to look a little bit different. It's going to you know, be maybe elongate, elongated or or flat or something like that. But you still know that. It's the same coffee cup in the same place. Well, let me make sure I understand before we go further. I mean, isn't the point of virtual reality that they don't do that? Like, they <laughs> well, it, it's not good, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, they want it to be perfect, but it's far from it. But you can still adapt to it real quickly. Okay. You have, you have a limitation of, of the fact that you're projecting onto a plane, a three dimensional image, even though they're stereo images. There's there's a there's a still a sense of unreality with that. That you, okay. you your vergence is not the same when you when you bring your eyes together. I mean, th so they have how, these weird yeah. optics that try to compensate for it, but it's imperfect. Okay, so so Lucas, now what's your what's your point about that? Did you want to? Did you have a question? Or, 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 no, no. Uh, my point is that we, we, the object may change. Not not just like may have a weird transformation, but you still know that's the same object. I think in that case, for example, you're building different reference frames each time the object is transformed a bit. But you can still navigate that environment. Mm. Right. So just yeah. well, I guess it gets back to this question: Can the cortex handle transformations in certain dimensions and not in other dimensions? Um, 
you know, um, you know, the idea of stretching out the coffee cup is sort of an example of what you might see in the virtual reality world, right? You know, you move around, perhaps the coffee cup looks elongated now because they didn't do the transformation correctly. Um, and the question is, um, um, I, I, I guess it's a good question. Uh, I don't see how the neural mechanisms can support that, but clearly we have some capabilities to do that. And I was arguing that perhaps it's doing at this level of, um, um, you know, sort of uh, seeing the similarity between two objects. I mean, again, if, if, if I see that elongated coffee cup, I know it's not a regular coffee cup. That's, what, that's why you know there's an error, right? You just know there's an error. This isn't a regular coffee cup. And the mm -hmm. question is, does it remap? Uh, create a new reference frame, or does it, um, or does it uh, uh, um, not create a new reference chain, but then see similarities based on another mechanism? I guess it's, we could consider that an open question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I, I now want to introduce a new topic, unless there's any more questions on this. It's a related topic. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask something about uh, scale. Uh, so. so so um, have have you? I'm I'm curious if a thought has crossed your mind that um, you could choose to unbundle the scale into there. There are really two different kinds of scales here uh, that go with two different kinds of movements. Uh, eye movements, which are ro rotating your eyes, and you know body movements, or something like like if you actually move the location of the eye wh where it is in the reference frame of. The you mean like rotating the eye in its socket or moving your head? Or does yeah, it yeah, either of, either of those. Okay. Yeah, ro rotating your eye in the socket or you like physically stepping to the left or to the right uh, or forward, etc. cetera. Um, if you're staying still, um, if you're moving your eye over an object, it doesn't really matter how far away it is and how large it is. Like you might be looking at a coffee cup this close by and small, or you might be looking at like a giant coffee cup in the sky a mile away. Uh, I'm, I'm bringing up a silly example, but you could come up with better examples where there's an ambiguity there. There's a distance ambiguity that doesn't need to be solved if you're only moving your eyes. Uh, that, uh, that is one type of scale. What you say doesn't need to be solved. Uh, uh, we're, con yeah. we're consciously aware of, um, we'll keep, well, I, I'm confused by that. Well, I, I think he's saying that the, the representation of the coffee cup has equal angular displacements. And so uh, if you change the yes. scale, you don't need to know the absolute scale. This as long as the angular displacements map. Well, in that case, the scale of movement would be the same, right? Because you're moving the same number of degrees to achieve the same movement and reference no, frame. No, uh, so, so like if you look at an object and you're only moving your eyes over it, you, you do not need to figure out how far away that object is or how large it is well, to I, recognize it. Uh, no, but you, I, 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 let's just, let's say I separate out two scenarios. One is you're looking at pictures on a piece of paper, right? Sure. That's an easy one because you can say, look, I have never, I've never think like, oh, it's a different object because it's one size, one picture coffee cup, one moment is big and another moment is small. Not even aware of it. I just think of like, that's a coffee cup. I'm looking at a picture of a coffee cup, no problem. Um, and I do have to scale to, to, to recognize it and to infer and so on. But in reality, if I see, um, if I were to see a, a, a coffee cup on my table and one outside, and the one outside had the same angular displacement you know, size as the one on my table, I would say, well, that's a huge coffee cup out there. <laughs> that, is a that is one hell of a coffee cup. <laughs> you know, it's six feet tall. Um, uh, and so we are, are aware of that. I mean, in, in that scenario, unlike the piece of paper, the piece of paper, I don't go, wow, that's a six foot coffee cup. Or this is the this is a coffee cup's only an inch tall. I'm looking at a piece of paper and I just like, no, it's a coffee cup. But when I see them in the real world, I have this sense of how far away they are. And somehow that impacts my perception of it. Uh, then at this point, yeah. I say, I do know that they're different. Although I could still use the same reference frame, um, perhaps. Yeah, so I, I'm saying you, that scale is split into two parts. One tells you, if I move my eyes, what will I sense? Yeah. The other tells you, if I step forward, what will I sense? Well, those um, can be untangled. Yeah, maybe. I, I think you're actually getting to my question in the next 
bullet I'm going to make here, which is an observation that which I certainly haven't dealt with before, which relates to this, perhaps. So maybe can you just keep that thought in your head, Marcus, while sure. I go on to the next one here? Um, there's a problem of this scenario that we've, we've got here. There could be lots of problems, but there's one that seems to be really jumping out of me right now. And here's the problem. I have argued that these, these voting neurons in between columns are basically representing the object you're perceiving. Uh, the object that you're looking at. And I've, arg I've argued that that's what we perceive, but that's not what we perceive. What we perceive is an object at an orientation, not the object. So when I look at a coffee cup on my table here, I don't just say, oh, it's a coffee cup. I perceive the orientation of the, of the object. It, it, it's a different perception if I rotate the coffee cup, same cup, but what I'm perceiving includes the orientation of the cup. And as we've written our paper so far, and as we've talked about these voting neurons, we haven't really dealt with this issue. We just say, oh, the voting neurons are just determining the object. But, but that's not what I perceive. I'm perceiving the object plus the orientation of the object at the same time. It's not like I have some just generic coffee cup image. It's like, no, it's, and so, and then here's another issue. The perceived orientation is relative to the body, not the center. So it's not the same orientation that we're talking about in a column. The column's orientation is like, where's my finger relative to the cup? But when I perceive the cup, if I'm touching the cup with my hand, my perception of the orientation of the cup is relative to my body. Uh, I'm not aware of the orientation of my finger relative to the cup, but I am aware of the orientation of the cup relative to my body. Even if I'm touching the object with a single finger in a black box, I, I have this, then I have this mental image of the, of the coffee cup at some position in orientation and rotation relative to my body. Um, and so we don't really have, uh, we have, we've never really dealt with this. We haven't really asked ourselves how this occurred. Um, and so I want to talk about that briefly in the next slide, but does everyone understand this issue with the problem here? Yeah, and I, I don't know, I guess, is it also uh, fair to say maybe that like other things as well, like if obviously if the coffee cup is occluded, you would also perceive, um, you know, your, your perception is just the, as well as recognizing the object, you perceive the the non-included parts of the object, and I you think, can be quite, you could be quite specific if someone asked you yeah. what part of the object is occluded, or draw me what part of the object is yeah. occluded. So we you already could do have that in quite a detailed manner. We already have an explanation for that, you know, and, and I wrote about it in the book. Is that. Once some of the columns are voting and these people, these columns are saying, oh, it's a coffee cup, but half the coffee cup is excluded, right? Or occluded, excuse me. Um, well, those voting neurons cover the entire region. And so all the columns know what's being perceived, even if they're not getting any sensory input. So the voting neurons, I'm a, I'm a column that's being occluded, but I'm, I'm, getting, I'm being told that the thing we're observing is a coffee cup. And somehow I'm able to figure out what my relative position on that cup is. If I can, then I can predict what I would see. Um, I, we don't have an answer to how those occluded columns can necessarily know their location. Um, but assuming that the, the occluded columns know what the object is and its orientation, and if they were able to somehow figure out what the likely location on the object is, uh, which is an open question, how they do that, but then they would be able to predict it. They would say, yeah, well, I know I'm not seeing anything, but this is what I should be seeing, or I would be seeing if I, if I were getting input. So I think that's a, a different problem. It's a, I think it's a problem we at least have a partial answer to, whereas what I'm talking about here is a new problem. <laughs> I think it's a new problem uh, where we didn't have any concept at all about orientation as being a shared feature um, uh, before. That, does that help? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is pretty bothersome. Anyone else have a question about this before I go to the next slide? Because then I'll leave this slide. How does this relate to the kind of the what versus where pathway? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so here's, here's the next slide. All right. So I asked myself, okay, there's an assumption here because I am perceiving object and orientation that there are stable neurons representing object and orientation. And the question is, how does the cortex do that? All right, they're stable. My eyes are moving, but the coffee cup seems stable. Its orientation seems stable. Its, its identity seems stable. So what are the possibilities? I came up with, well, the spoiler is I don't know the answer to this question, <laughs> um, but I came up with, with four possibilities. 
And I thought I would just mention them. Um, one possibility is that we still have a single layer of neurons, that a single layer of neurons is stable, representing both object and orientation, just like we, we've been arguing that an object can be represented by stable neurons. Um, but this, this has a problem. All my potential solutions have problems. Um, if there was a single layer of neurons representing both object and orientation, remember the voting layer has to learn, right? The voting layer has to, the columns when they're voting have to say, yeah, we've all learned what a coffee cup is, therefore we can all form these connections, therefore now we'll know how to vote on a coffee cup. So, but this would imply that this single layer of neurons representing orientation and object would imply that it would be very difficult to learn how to vote because you'd have to learn all combinations of objects and orientation uh, and that can't be learned. That's too many things. So you couldn't learn all like, oh, I'm gonna learn, uh, you know, coffee cup at this orientation, coffee cup at this orientation, coffee cup, no, it's not gonna work. There's just too many things to do. So I don't see how this could work. I've talked to, thought, played around with the idea that you could generate a, um, uh, a representation like this using a module-like approach, uh, meaning like a grid cell module-like approach. So you could have, um, you could come up with a unique representation for object at orientation, uh, that within a column might be stable. Um, and you could do this by using the, the module trick, meaning like you could have um, uh, multiple uh, or, orientation modules um, that vote, that, that combine together to give you a unique orientation. And therefore you could, I, I don't think I, I'm gonna go through it more than that, but you could generate a representation like this, but I still don't think you could vote on a representation like this. I just don't see how that could happen. So that's the problem with that one. Although that's what we seem to perceive. We seem to perceive one, one thing, like this is a coffee cup at a position. You know? um, there's another possibility is that you might have two layers of neurons, uh, one for object and one for orientation. And these, these ones could vote. We could learn all orientations in the orientation um, column as a layer, and we can learn objects in the object layer. That would actually work. And they would vote independently but then it's not clear to me why I'd have a singular percept, a single percept of object and orientation. I'd have one percept of this object and another percept of orientation, or I'd have one set of cells representing object, one set of cells representing orientation. Um, it would solve everything, but this is where um, introspection could be failing me, and I don't want to get hung up on this, you know, but it, it's, it's, it's a little bit more tricky now because if I wanted to, for example, remember what I saw, um, I want to say, hey, I saw that coffee cup today. And um, if I were to remember what I saw, uh, very often I would remember the orientation with it. It's like, oh, I saw, you know, this car that was facing, that was, you know, upside down today, or it was facing away from me, or something like that. Well, I would remember that. I don't just remember I saw a car, I could remember the orientation of the car. Therefore, you somehow have to be broadcasting these two signals throughout the brain in, in some place like the anterior cortex or the hippocampal complex which is going to form a, a memory of this. We'd have to remember both of those at the same time. So it makes it a little complicated. It's like, okay, we have these two things that we perceive as the same as one thing, but really two separate things. And, and we have to, if we're going to remember what happened, we have to remember both of them. That makes it hard. Um, if you have questions about this, let me know. Um, I have not so much questions, but two good Duncans. Um, one is if you have a image of a coffee cup at some random orientation and in sequence, you, you carve it on up into, I don't know, uh, a four by four grid and you show- wait, 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 What do you mean, a three-dimensional grid or is like a- I, I'm This is an image, just an okay. image. So like and, image patches image patches okay. and you display the image patches there's let's say it's a four by four it's 16 of them you know you display all 16 but time displaced and random can you assemble a picture of that coffee cup and its orientation uh if if they say they're coming at like one second intervals why why are you doing time displacement what's the advantage of that what i'm what i'm trying to do uh because it's an uh, I haven't said what the second one is because it's in, in contrast. What I'm trying to see is whether it's the components of the object that are being tracked for orientation as opposed to the gestalt of the object. So the other one would be uh, you take a feature of the object like the loop of the uh, of the coffee cup, the top rim, the bottom rim, 
uh, the other side of the coffee cup and display those displaced in time, uh, whether that's enough to get the information you want. So the notion is, am I assembling the pieces you know, uh, spatially or am I picking up features of them? And those are the key elements that my orientation and my I'm not sure uh, the distinction between those two, Kevin. The point is, imagine we can do this with a single column, right? You can do all of this with a single fingertip or looking through a narrow straw. And so uh, in that scenario with a single fingertip, clearly you do this through time, but it's it's the time matched with the reference frame location, right? It's not, it's not just that there's a sequence of things. It's like, because that's just a bag of features. Um, it's like each feature has to be assigned to a reference frame location. And that, that is what determines what the object is. So, um, I, and, and so that's the way to think about it. The way, in my mind, the way to think about it is it's like, yeah, I can do this sequentially in time, but it's not the, the time element is not the important part. It's the, it's the assignment each, each feature to the location in the reference frame is the important part. Well, well I, here's, here's, the, here's why I think it, it is important is that if, you, if you're assuming that the column has all that's necessary to recognize an object in arbitrary orientation. If you only show pieces of it, that thing can't fire. What do you mean it can't fire? I don't know what that means. It doesn't have the whole object. It's not recognizing the whole thing. It doesn't You're need giving... to. It just needs to recognize a set of features that are that are in an arrangement in a three-dimensional right. structure that is consistent with the object. Right, so that's why I'm trying to do time displacement of the thing. There's not yeah. going to be voting if if the pieces and time, if the pieces are not available simultaneously. So I'm Yeah, just... yeah, but, but, but this, I think this gets back to the whole voting mechanism in general, right? The, the system is, in, is inherently time-based. Everything is time-based. But, and so to recognize something, to learn something, you have to move the sensors over time in a reference frame. But we can do, you can do this, you know, the gestalt inference with multiple columns by voting, right? But it, it, it doesn't mean that the system is not time-based. It inherently is. It's, I mean, that's the whole point of, that's the, the key part of this whole theory. Maybe you know this, I'm missing your question. But the key part of the whole thousand brain theory is explains why we can look at an image in a flash and know what it is, even though you can't learn it that way. You have to learn it through time and generally inferences through time. So the system is inherently time-based and inherently movement-based, but we can do these gestalt things. It's a trick, um, the voting trick. Now, maybe I misunderstood your observation. Well, what, what I'm saying is, 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 is I, I, would, I would say that in both instances, you can recognize the object, once given as a flash, and once given as a, as components displaced in time, I think we're capable of doing both. And so, as a constraint on the model, you have to be able to account for both mechanisms of recognition. That's not right. learning, not learning recognition. Well, recognition assumes you've learned already, right? Right, so, but I mean, uh, no. So, but the thousand bank theories does do that, Kevin. I mean, it explains both. That's one of the beauties of the theory is it explains how we can do flash inference. Um, without movement, uh, it explains that without throwing away the idea that the entire system is sensory motor. It's just, it, it's, it's the voting mechanism says, right. yes, um, you have to build these, uh, these, um, these, these models based on reference frames and that requires movement. But only in inference is it possible to avoid the movement by if you have enough inputs coming in, everybody resolves their, their guesses at once then you can get to the right answer. Right, so you, you, said, you, you said twice now that you've explained how to do the flash, but you also have to be able to explain how you can uh, assemble over time components to recognize what it is. But that's the learning through movement. Okay, so you're saying learning. I'm talking about recognizing. Well, I don't know what you, it, okay, you can recognize something through movement or you can recognize something in a flash. Both of those are explained by the theory, right? Um, okay. Okay. Right? So, okay. I, 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 I grab a, I touch a coffee cup with one finger. I have to move to recognize the coffee cup unless there's a very unique feature. Um, and I can touch the coffee cup with three fingers. I may be able to recognize it without movement, but if I do move it, I can move, usually move less because they, you know, so there's this continuum from like, yeah, I, I have to do a lot of movement to recognize something to less movement to 
no movement if I have enough columns voting. I think it covers that whole spectrum very nicely. Okay. The, sec the second Duncan is uh, there was an image that I was shown, which was some kind of crease of fabric. Mm. And then a little more of the image was given, then a little more image, and at a certain point, it, you know, even though you didn't see the entire thing, you could snap and say, this is a picture of a man's collar. And I could go back to the previous images and look at them and saying, I, you know, I look at that and I can't, you know, I, uh, even though mentally I know that's where it came from, I can't see that as a man's collar. But at a certain point when enough features were available and it was an incomplete image, I could say, oh, you know, I could recognize that as a man's collar. Yeah. So that that tends that tends to you know when you, when we talk about occluded objects and we talk about you know what we're looking at as far as a, a gestalt of the thing, there's a certain point where there's a critical number of features that are available that is enough to say I can recognize it, I can explain this yeah, image with that. Right, exactly. It's because you have these features at relative positions to each other. It, that that there, there's a resolution you're saying if I if I if I uh, um, if I discover the relative position in, in a reference frame then then the proper reference frame will, you know the object will pop out mm -hmm. uh, because that's, there's only a single solution at this point there's enough of these features at these locations where it's unique to the object and it'll pop out. Um, so so where do you think that uh, that the, those individual features how where do you think they locate? Are they all within one column or? No, they... no, if, if, in that scenario, well, it depends. If you're saying I'm trying to show these features at the same time, then there are multiple columns getting them. The different columns are getting different features mm -hmm. and that's the voting, right? That's where voting occurs. They're saying I'm getting, one column saying I'm seeing a little bumpy thing here, but you know, so I've got this curvy thing. I don't know what it is. Another guy saying, saying I'm seeing like a buttonhole, but I don't know what that's from. And other person saying this, but then when they they vote and they know that they're in some relative position to one another, they say there's only one thing that's consistent with this. Um, and that's what the voting is all about. The voting mm -hmm. says they can they they all have ambiguity, but when they vote, there's no ambiguity because there's only one solution that fits all of them. Okay, that's so, that is the key part of the thousand ring theory. Okay, so the. Um... The locus of the resolution of this number of features together produces this object that's that's still distributed, but somehow something comes out of that to say this is this is this particular object. Well, it's something the something is the voting. I mean, again, it's not just it's not just uh, um, you know a bag of features. These are the features. We have enough features to identify the object. Uh, we didn't explain this, but Marcus was the first one to point this out that. Columns need to know their where their relative position is relative to each other as well. So, um, so they're saying we have these features in relative positions to each other, um, okay. and and that is sufficient to reduce the ambiguity about what all the objects that have those features relative positions to each other. At okay. some point, you don't have enough of that, and you can say, well, it could be still these three different objects. But at some point, it becomes unique enough. You can say, bingo, I did it. Um, so, so one would have to say that the feature in a consistent orientation would be enough to recognize the thing as opposed to a bag of features where they're all jumbled together. You know, that you can't yeah. necessarily say this thing. We can't, it can't be a bag of features. It's position, features in a relative positions in a reference frame. Um, okay. That, that's the way I would put it, not orientation, but relative locations in a reference frame. Okay, so. We don't know, the, we don't know yet which is the right, um, we don't know yet how to anchor the grid cells, if you will. We don't know which exact object this is, right. but we know enough to say um, these. By the fact that I've got a number of features in relative positions, one of those, then that tells us how to anchor the reference frame, and the object pops out. So, so when, what it is. can we can we then say that the the orientation output, if we're trying to, you know, if you're, the question was asked, what's the orientation of this thing? That's something which could be deduced by the relative positions of the features themselves. In other words, it, it could be an emergent property as well. I don't to, think so. Well, I mean, the relative features to the body? Relative features to themselves within whatever I, visual so frame I, you're I'm trying at. to, I'm, I, I, the point of this, this slide I'm working on right here right now is, is I think there's a separate problem. 
there's this, there's the relative position of the features in the reference name of the object. That's what you were just talking about. That's what we've been talking about in the thousand brain theory. Um, but our perceptual experience is that we recognize the object in a relative orientation to our body, which is not what the columns are dealing with. The columns are, we haven't had any need for the columns themselves to say, where is this object relative to the body? We just, we just have, all we need is each column has to know where its orientation and position is relative to the object. And so I was trying to make this distinction between what we've been talking about columns need to do, which is all object reference frames, Mm -hmm. And what our perceptual experience is of like, that's a coffee cup angled towards me at a certain position. That orientation is different. It's a different orientation. It's, it's a body centric orientation. Imagine, this, I'm, I'm gonna move on here for a second. Imagine I have this coffee cup in front of me and I'm moving my hand around the backside, the front side, all over the place, touching with multiple fingers, right? The, the, the orientation of my fingers to that coffee cup are all changing radically as I do this. And each column needs to know that orientation of its particular input relative to the reference frame uh, wow. of the coffee cup. But my perception of the orientation of the cup to my body is stable. And therefore, there's a separate representation of coffee cup to my body that has absolutely nothing to do with where my fingers are at that moment. I mean, it, there's a, obviously a set of transformations that have to occur to make this, this pop mm -hmm. out. So all I'm saying is it's not clear to me where this a perception of orientation relative to my body comes from. Does it exist in the columns themselves? Is it created elsewhere? I'm just, and this is a big confusion here. Let me just go finish my, my list of things I talked about here. I said, number one, I said, you could have a single layer of neurons representing both object and orientation, but I didn't know how those neurons could, could learn to, to both. And then second, you have these two layers of neurons, one for object, one for orientation. I don't even know how that would work, but, um, but I don't know how you'd end up with a single percept from that. There's another variation of that, which is what something Subutai brought up earlier, which is like, maybe it has to do with what columns and where columns, maybe what columns and where columns divide this problem up somehow. This is a variation of number two, um, where perhaps what columns could vote on object ID and where columns could vote on orientation relative to the body. Because we think of where columns are generally, um, they represent locations relative to the body in some sense. But it, again, it's, it's like a centralized part of my body. It's not like relative to my hand. It's like relative to my entire body. I don't think about where the coffee cup is. Unless I attend to it, I don't think about where the coffee cup is relative to my hand. I just perceive it at some, or relative to my eyes. I'd say it's, it's perceptually relative to my body. Um, and then there could be other solutions to this. Um, and I say, recall the perceived orientation is relative to the body, not the sensor. So, this implies some sort of pooling to construct orientation relative to the body. I could take all these different column orientations and somehow they relate to the body orientation. But, you know, and, and Marcus again was the first person to point out there's other cortical areas related that, that are highly connected to the cortex. You could be playing this role, it can be involved in this, whether it's the, the striatum or the retrospinal cortex, there's other areas that could be involved in this perception of orientation relative to the body. Um, so I, I'm going to end with my presentation. We can continue the discussion, but I, I felt these are more constraints on the problem um, I've introduced today. The constraints of, of scale, the constraints of trying to merge the vision and the touch sensations together in some way, and um, also this whole idea that object orientation relative to the body is part of our percept, which we haven't really talked about, as far as I recall, in the past. So um, again, it makes the problem more complicated, but it constraints are generally good because they, they, it'll force us to think of the right solution. Okay, now I can, I, I'm done with my presentation. We can talk all we want. Just finish <laughs> talking okay, the, the, the one thing I was, I was trying to, to lead to with, with uh, was looking at those components and, what, uh, and their relative orientation is that would argue that at least for that problem, you need a blending of what and where to come up with a resolution. I mean, you're, you're looking at a different problem. You're looking at body orientation with respect to everything else, but it would seem like you still need what and where, even if you're trying to assemble the components of the features and saying these things make a coherent whole, you need both of those things to I don't say, think you need the where, to, to recognize the object, you don't need the where pathway. That's the whole idea. And there's nothing in, the theory says that, there's nothing in the where pathway, you need to know this. You um, need to know where the features are relative to each other. Yeah, but they're all, the question is, what is the reference frame? If it's an object reference frame, then that's in the what pathway. 
and all you need to know that, but in an object reference frame, you don't need to know that in a body centric reference frame to recognize the object. Okay, so when you say what there, it's not just uh, identifying features, you're saying- No, you're the what pathways, it's the what pathways. It's not like what features are there, it's the what pathways. So the what pathway is well known to be sufficient to recognize objects. Um, right. And, it, and including everything, all the things we've talked about, eye movements, you know, locations, orientations, all that stuff is all taken care of in the, in the, in the what pathway. Um, but you, if you don't have the where pathway, then you'll say there's a coffee cup at this orientation, but I don't know where it is relative to my body. That's what people okay. with the damage where pathway say. They say, I can see the coffee cup. I can see its features. I know what it is, but I don't know where it is. <laughs> I can't reach for it. Um, okay. And so, the other way around is they can, if you damage the what pathways, they can say, there's an object over there. I know how to reach it, but I don't know what it is. So in, in, in this instantiation, what you're saying is the where pathway is, uh, is, is body relative. It has nothing to do with where the features are with respect to each other. You're, you're, you're incorporating that's right. that as that's, part of the, it's, the, it's, the what pathway. That's what the, the empirical evidence we have says. That's what our theory is, what we propose say. Um, Yes, so it's all about if the reference frame is relative to the body or if the reference frame is relative to the object. And this is why this idea that I recognize the orientation okay. of the object uh, in my percept of recognizing an object, you know, even just sticking my finger into the black box, feeling around, sensing a coffee cup, I now have this orientation of the entire coffee cup. I perceive the coffee cup as being a coffee cup at some orientation to my body. That seems to occur. Um, you know, I don't, that's my first step. I don't need to know that as far as I can tell to recognize the coffee cup, but it's what I perceive. So I'm just saying that somehow this pops out when we recognize something. And I'm suggesting that maybe then the where columns are involved in that perceptual experience, if not the recognition, somehow they're involved. Again, I'm separating two orientations, the orientation of my finger to the coffee cup, which is very different than the coffee cup to my body. I don't perceive the orientation of my finger to the coffee cup unless I attend to my finger. Um, but I always perceive the orientation of the coffee cup to my body. And that's the thing that's weird about it. Uh, perhaps if I had I a damaged wear pathway, I wouldn't perceive the orientation of the coffee cup to my body. I would just say, there's a coffee cup out there. I don't know its orientation. I don't know the answer to that question. I was going to say, I think there's one of these classic studies, I can't remember, it's like Milner et al. or something, with uh, this case study, DF. I think she had a, um, a parietal kind of wear lesion, but she could... Um, she could <laughs> describe the orientation of bars, for example, and uh, and or, or kind of their angle, and and had some kind of information about that. But she couldn't uh, like orient a an item to put through like a letterbox that was at a particular angle. But basically, she seemed to have perceptual access to that orientation information. Just not motor access. Yeah, but but I guess the question is the the orientation of the bars relative to what reference. Frame? Right. Um, one would say if you had uh, did this subject have a damage to the what pathway or the where pathway? I don't remember. Oh, uh, so this was damage to the um, to the where pathway. The where pathway. So in that theory, I mean, I, this is all very theoretical. What I would think about is okay. Well, they would uh, they would be able to perceive the the um, the orientation of a feature relative to some object. But again, they wouldn't be able to know where that object, where that feature is relative to the body. So they would not be able to reach and pass a, a letter through the spot, just in the sense that they can't, they can't reach out and grab anything. Um, if you've damaged the wear way, the general rule is you can't reach it. You can't locate it relative to your body. So that you yes. perceive it. I, I think what I'm saying is, I don't know if you meant this, but that's consistent with what I, I think what we've been talking about. Uh, or did you mean it to be the inconsistency? Yeah, I guess may maybe then I misunderstood. I guess uh, I'd interpreted what you said as as there wouldn't be access to that orientation information in the what pathway. Yeah, I, I, there wouldn't not, be access yeah. to the the orientation of again. There's an orientation to the reference frame of an external object and orientation to the reference frame of the body. So, right. I guess it's it's hard though then to. Talk about the, the if it's the orientation of a bar, if 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 that if it's literally a bar, it's kind of what is the reference frame that it's oriented exactly. to, unless it is the body. 
Well, you could say what's the, I could put a stripe on the coffee cup and I could say, what's the orientation of the, the stripe to the coffee cup? And you could say, what's well, vertical, what's at an angle, what's in, around the belly of the cup, something like that. Um, I think if you had a damage to the wet path, but you'd still see the bar, the stitch at stripe, and you'd say, oh, that's a horizontal stripe or a vertical stripe or an angle stripe, but you wouldn't be able to tell me what's its relative position to the, to the object that it's on. So if I just showed you a stripe, I'd say, yeah, it's vertical, it's horizontal, it's diagonal. I could see that using my wear path place. Um, but I wouldn't be able to say what its position is orientation relative to some object in the world um, without the what path. So I think the questions you have to ask the subject are very, be very careful about separating. Them. Yeah, yeah, I, I might um, see if I can find that study again. That would be it's useful if you look it up. Exactly what they did. Yeah. yeah, I think it was 1991 or something like that, but I'll, I'll find it. Yeah, another problem with a lot of these studies is that um, when they're lesion studies, like then uh, they're not very well controlled. And so you don't know what damage, the extent of the damage, and um, you know how much of its damage was the damage on the other side. There's just a lot of things they don't know. So, you, um, you know, especially with humans, right? You just they're not going to go out and, and, and say, oh, well, you you know your your this region was damaged. We're going to remove the whole thing just to be sure we <laughs> something's still operating. You know? Right. Um, <laughs> so I think anytime you do with these human studies like this, uh, you have to be really careful. Um, because nothing is very, very controlled uh, when it comes to lesions. It's always a mess. It's a bit of a mess. So we can make general conclusions. But I, 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 maybe I'm mis misinterpreting what you're saying, you know, but it seems to me still that this idea that someone could recognize orientation to things, but you'd have to ask them again, orientation relative to what? Anyway, I, I think yeah. this, I, I just want to bring up this a problem. Um, and I, I view this as a pretty difficult problem to think about, which is this idea that you perceive in the orientation and the object at the same time. And, and they don't seem like two separate percepts. They seem like one thing. And it's, it's puzzling to me um, how that comes about and um, both the mechanisms and the perception of it. Um, and it's also interesting, obviously, if I'm seeing, if I'm observing the cup at this particular orientation to my body, I can still identify the cup, right? I can, independent of its orientation, I would say that's this particular coffee cup. So I'm able to extract out that information either from the, the dual representation or maybe there's two sets of neurons and one's the object and I can just label the object. And then that's again, bring, that's number two and that and, and number three. And that again brings up the question is, well, why do I perceive this as one? Why do I have one percept? I don't know. Um, I, I got to admit, this is you know, a bit hand waving these arguments, but I think there's some serious uh, problems and issues here. Other thoughts? All right, going once, going <laughs> twice, <laughs> three times. All right. Um, I do think I made some progress here, by the way, on the scales issue. I, I've given a lot of thought to that, and I, I really feel like um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my, my mind around this, um, what this means. Um, so I feel good about that. Okay, end of that, we can stop sharing. And we can probably stop recording. <laughs>